This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 6 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kwame Genov, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash k w a m e g e n o v v. The Jail. Section 1. The days ring with noisy clamor. There is constant going and coming. The clatter of levers, the slamming of iron doors, continually reverberates through the corridors. The dull thud of a football in the cell above hammers on my head with maddening regularity. In my ears is the yelling and shouting of coarse voices. Cell number eleven, to court, right away. A prisoner hurriedly passes my door. His step is nervous, and his look expectant fear. Hurry there, to court. Good luck, Jimmy. The man flushes and diverts his face as he passes a group of visitors clustered about an overseer. Who is that officer? One of the ladies advances, Lorgna in hand, and stares boldly at the prisoner. Suddenly, she shrinks back. A man is being led past by the guards. His face is bleeding from a deep gash, his head swathed in bandages. The officers thrust him violently into a cell. He falls heavily against the bed. Oh, don't! For Jesus' sake, don't! The shutting of the heavy door drowns his cries. The visitors crowd about the cell. What did he do? He can't come out now, officer. No, ma'am. He's safe. The lady's laugh rings clear and silvery. She steps closer to the bars, eagerly peering into the darkness. A smile of exciting security plays about her mouth. What has he done, officer? Stole some clothes, ma'am. Disdainful disappointment is on the lady's face. Where is that man who, er, we read in the papers yesterday? You know, the newspaper artist who killed, er, that girl in such a brutal manner. Oh, Jack Tarlin. Murderer's Row. This way, ladies. Section 2 The sun is slowly nearing the blue patch of sky, visible from my cell in the western wing of the jail. I stand close to the bars to catch the cheering rays. They glide across my face with tender, soft caress, and I feel something melt within me. Closer, I press to the door. I long for the precious embrace to surround me, to envelop me, to pour its soft balm into my aching soul. The last rays are fading away, and something out of my heart is departing with them. But the lengthening shadows on the grey flagstone spread quiet. Gradually, the clamor ceases, the sounds die out. I hear the creaking of rusty hinges, there is the click of a lock and all is hushed and dark. The silence grows gloomy, oppressive. It fills me with mysterious awe. It lives. It pulsates with slow, measured breathing, as of some monster. It rises and falls, approaches, recedes. It is misery asleep. Now it presses heavily against my door. I hear its quickened breathing. Oh, it is the guard. Is it the death watch? His outline is lost in the semi-darkness, but I see the whites of his eyes. They stare at me. They watch and follow me. I feel their gaze upon me as I nervously pace the floor. Unconsciously, my step quickens, but I cannot escape that glint of steel. It grimaces and mocks me. It dances before me. It is here and there, all around me. Now it flits up and down. It doubles, triples. The fearful eyes stare at me from a hundred depressions in the wall. On every side they surround me and bar my way. I bury my head in the pillow. My sleep is restless and broken. Ever the terrible gaze is upon me, watching, watching, the white eyeballs turning with my every movement. Section 3 The line of prisoners files by my cell. They walk in twos, conversing in subdued tones. It is a motley crowd from the ends of the world. The native of the western part of the state the Pennsylvania Dutchman of stolid mien passes slowly, in silence. The son of southern Italy, stocky and black-eyed, alert suspicion on his face, walks with quick, nervous step. The tall, slender Spaniard, swarthy and of classic feature, looks about him with suppressed disdain. Each, in passing, casts a furtive glance into my cell. The last in the line is a young negro, walking alone. He nods and smiles broadly at me, exposing teeth of dazzling whiteness. The guard brings me up the rear. He pauses at my door, his sharp eye measuring me severely, 
critically. You may fall in. The cell is unlocked, and I join the line. The negro is at my side. He loses no time in engaging me in conversation. He is very glad, he assures me, that they have at last permitted me to fall in. It was a shame to deprive me of exercise for four days. Now they will call the night dog off. Must be a feared suicide, he explains. His flow of speech is incessant. He seems not a whit disconcerted by my evident disinclination to talk. Would I have a cigarette? May smoke in the cell. One could buy de weed here if he has de dough. Buy anything set booze. He is full of the prison gossip. That tall man there is Jack Tinford of Homestead. Sure to swing. Threw dynamite at the Pinkertons. That little doggo will keep Jack company. Cut his wife's throat. The duchy there is Bugs. Choked his son in sleep. Presently, my talkative companion volunteers the information that he also is waiting for trial. Nothing worse than second-degree murder, though. Can't hang him, he laughs gleefully. His man didn't croak till after the ninth day. He lightly waves aside my remark concerning the ninth day superstition. He is convinced they won't hang him. Can't do it, he reiterates with a happy grin. Suddenly, he changes the subject. What am you doing here? Only murder cases on this side gallery. Your man didn't croak. Evidently, he expects no answer, immediately assuring me that I am all right. Guess they believe it I am most safe for yo, but can't hang yo, can't hang yo. He grows excited over the recital of his case. Minutely, he describes the details. Dat big nigger, guess he tots I afeard of him. He know better now, he chuckles. Dis I chilly I'm afeard of none of em, I ain't. Gwan way nigger, I says to him, ya better leave mine gal be. And dat big black nigger grabbed a cleaver. We's in do tell kitchen, ya see. Nigger drop dat a hollows, and he come at me. Den dis I coon pull his trusty lil brudder, he taps his pocket significantly, and I lets the ordinary nigger have it. Plum in the belly, ya sa, I does, and he drops his cleaver, and I pulls my knife out two inches, bout, and then I gives it a half twist, like, and shoves it in again, and he illustrates the ghastly motion. Dat bad nigger never bother me again, no nobody else, I guess. But they can't hang me, no sir, they can't, cause my man croaked two weeks later. As lucky, yes sir, I is. His face is reft in a broad grin, his teeth shimmer white. Suddenly, he grows serious. Yo am striker? No, not a steel worker? With utter amazement. What you want to shoot Frick for? He does not attempt to disguise his impatient incredulity as I essay an explanation. A fear to tell. Yo am deep, all right, I lick. Dat your name? But yo am right, yes, sir, yo am right. Don't tell nobody. Day's mostly crooks. Dat day am, dat day need watch and show. Yo just member dat. There is a peculiar movement in the marching line. I notice a prisoner leave his place. He casts an anxious glance around and disappears in the niche of a cell door. The line continues on its march, and, as I near the man's hiding place, I hear him whisper, Fall back, Alec. Surprised at being addressed in such a familiar manner, I slow down my pace. The man is at my side. Say, Burke, you don't want to be seen walking with that dinge. The sound of my shortened name grates harshly on my ear. I feel the impulse to resent the mutilation. The man's manner suggests a lack of respect, offense to my dignity as a revolutionist. Why? I ask, turning to look at him. He is short and stocky. The thin lips and pointed chin of the elongated face suggest the fox. He meets my gaze with a sharp look from above his smoked glass spectacles. His voice is husky, his tone unpleasantly confidential. It is bad for a white man to be seen with a nigger, he informs me. It'll make feeling against me. He himself is a Pittsburgh man for the last twenty years, but he was born and raised in the South, in Atlanta. They have no use for niggers down there, he assures me. They must be taught to keep their place, and they are no good anyway. I had better take his advice, for he is friendly disposed toward me. I must be very careful of appearances before the trial. My inexperience is quite evident, but he knows the ropes. I must not give them an opportunity to say anything against me. My behavior in jail will weigh with the judge in determining my sentence. He, he himself expects to get off easy. He knows some of the judges, mostly good men. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.